Yes, uh, so we are ThinkCell. We are a small software company in Berlin. Um, actually, actually in the city center, um, not in the outskirts, right there. Um, and we are about 35 people, not too many. And we are still always looking for developers. That's why we do these kind of things. And um, I will talk today about from iterators to ranges. Um, our code already uses ranges pervasively everywhere. And I think it really changed the style how we program. And I think everyone, should we turn down the lights? I think we had the different light configuration. Okay, anyway. So, um, yes. So, yeah, I think it really changed the style in which we program. And um, so in the beginning, I was just going to ask you, who is already, who knows ranges? Who knows boost range? Okay, quite a few. Who knows Eric Niebler's effort with ranges? About as many. And, um, and who already uses ranges in everyday programming? <coughs> okay, still quite few. Um, I, I think you will, the, your code will really benefit if you use more ranges. Anyway, so why ranges? Um, well, everyone knows this problem. Um, you define a container like a vector. And uh, when you want to sort the vector, you say sort, begin, end. And when you want to erase something from the vector, you're going to say erase, and then you say unique begin, end again, and then you say end again. So you're always saying begin and end and end and begin and begin and end. And that, that's really ugly. So um, with the library, with our library, you can just write, okay, uh, write unique in place, sort of the vector. And that's it. Um, much nicer, so you don't have to repeat yourself. Um, that said, I want to give you a little task. There is a mistake in that statement here. And I think we really... Oh, okay, there he comes. Um, there is a mistake here. A structural mistake. Who can tell me what the problem is with that statement? <coughs> When you write that in your code, is that okay? Looks kind of canonical, but is it? It isn't. What does sort do? It sorts. What does it use to sort? What does the sort use to sort? Operator less. What does unique use to unique? Operator equality, right? So this is a bug. So not only when you use ranges, you get shorter code, you also get more consistent code because, of course, you're not going to put that same mistake into your unique in place that you can write once. Anyway, um, why do I think I know something about ranges? We are at ThinkCell, we have about a code base of about a million lines, and um, Along with that code base, we've been growing our library. And I'm saying growing because it's, um, you don't build a library where you just make a design, you write the library, and you're done. Libraries have to be used to be good. And this library gets used a lot. Now, the problem with libraries that get used a lot is once they're used a lot, you can't change them anymore because people are screaming. Now, we have the luxury that we can actually do both at the same time. We can use our library. And if we feel like it, we can change it. And we actually have someone who does nothing else all day but code refactoring. So whenever we change the library, we actually change our code along with the library. So both kind of grew in lockstep. And I think we learned a lot about what, how, a, how a range library, a library in general, but in particular our range library, how does that have to be in order to be useful? It, it gets a lot of usage. And I think that, that taught us a lot about how um, the library has to look like, and some of that I will pass on to you today. Now, first of all, what do we have in ranges in C++ as, in, in terms of ranges in C++ 17 already? Well, it turns out not much. We have the range-based for loop, okay, and then we have um, the stip begin and end, which is it's a bit funny because the stip begin and end doesn't quite fit to the range-based for loop um, because the range-based for loop actually allows ADL, but the, uh, the stip begin and end does not. So stip begin and end is kind of a, you, you should not never use it like that. You should always write using stip begin and then begin. 
so that you get the chance for ADL to actually dispatch to a begin that someone may have defined in the namespace outside of the class. Anyway, but that's all. We won't have any more. Now, um, the ranges go into the standard library soon, and that's mainly thanks to, to Eric Niebler um, with his ranges TS. Um, the ranges TS is, is kind of the basic foundations of ranges. There is also the first time concepts have been used quite a bit in the standard library. Well, we focus here on the ranges. Ranges TS is pretty basic. It basically gives algorithm support for ranges. So instead of writing, say, accumulate with begin and end, you can now just have one argument, which is a range, and it will call begin and end for you. It's actually defined that way if you read the standard. It just calls begin and end for you. Um, now, the real meat, the real interesting part of ranges are in the library, the range v3 library, which is currently not part of what is being standardized. Um, eventually, I'm, I'm guessing that, that the standard committee will standardize what is in range v3. And basically, ThinkCell's library is kind of like a parallel development. And we made different design choices in some places, and I'll, I'll talk about them. Now, first of all, what are ranges? Well, ranges are the containers you know, vector, string, list. Um, they all have in common that they own their elements. Um, they provide deep copying semantics. And they also have deep constants. If the vector is const, you can't change its elements. Now you think, well, that's quite natural. Well, not so much, because um, there are also views. How are views different? Views actually reference their elements. They don't own them. They just point at them. And they have shallow copy semantics, you just copy references, and shallow constants. So if the, the object is const, it doesn't mean necessarily that you cannot change the elements. And you think, well, that's kind of a strange beast, but it's really not, because this is exactly what we had with iterators. So essentially, you can think of as a view as, as this is the plain old iterator pair that we had for, for a long, long time. Now, these are um, not so interesting. Um, these, these iterator pairs. We had them already pretty much, but you can uh, do more interesting stuff with, with ranges. Um, in particular, there are two range adapters that are used everywhere. So here is, first of all, the problem we are trying to solve. Say you have an, a, a ranges find that finds a four in a vector of ints. Okay, um, fair enough. Now, if you want to find a 4 in, a in, in the ID field in a structure A down here, this looks actually very different. Up here, you can find ranges find B4. But down here, you have a find if. You don't have a find. And you have a lambda that you pass in that does the comparison. And so, so the two things kind of do similar things, but you don't see that. The, 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 um, the syntax is very different. Now, why is that? Well, because we kind of lumped the projection onto the ID together with a comparison with 4. And the idea is that um, with the transform adapter, that you, whenever you are traversing a, a, a range, that then a, a certain function is just applied to every element of the range and at the time when you access it. So the projection will actually be done at the time of access. And then you can, since, since the, uh, the structure of A is, is first turned into a structure of ints by using the transform, you can then use the regular range as find. So the, the similarities between the two are much more apparent. Mm, now, uh, when you do this, what's the it pointing to? Well, it's an iterator, but it's still pointing at ints, right? Because we just transformed our range of, the, the, of, of structures into a range of ints. So the iterator is going to point to ints. Of course, you may want to actually, you may want the underlying A back. So um, what do you have to do? Usually, there is something like a base function, where you take the iterator that you got out, you call base, and then you get the underlying iterator. Because essentially, the iterator that is, that is giving you the int has to somehow remember where it is in, in the world of A's. 
Here's a possible implementation. Um, quite, quite simple. You essentially have a special iterator, and the special iterator stores a function, and it stores the iterator to the underlying base, uh, the, the underlying base range. And whenever you do the dereferencing, you just apply the function to <coughs> the result of the iterator. And here's the base. It just gives you back the sort internal iterator. Quite simple. Now, here's the other interesting adapter, and, and that covers many, many applications for ranges, these two. It's the filter. So here you say, OK, you want the A with the, 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 uh, the range of all the A's, where, which, have a, um, which have an ID field of 4. So we filter the, the vector here, the vector of A's, with that criterion, and then we get a range of A's which contains only the A's, which have ID4. Now here's the implementation again. You have a functor, and you have an iterator. Hold on a second. You have another iterator. Why do you need another iterator? <clears throat> well, the problem is, if I'm starting to filter, if I'm incrementing, right, and, and I say, no, oh, this element is no good, and this element is no good either, I may fell off the edge at the end. And, and then, so to prevent falling off the edge, falling off the end, you need to somehow detect when you actually reach the end. And, say, and that's why you need the end iterator. All right, um, that's quite, quite nice. Um, you see that here, there's the end check. Um, okay. Now, let's see. How does an iterator like this look like? I mean, we want to stack these things, right? Why only filter once? I mean, maybe the filter comes out of a function, and the filter, the return, the, the function that returns the filtered range gets again filtered, and so on. And you don't even know how many things you're wrapping into each other. Uh, otherwise, it's quite easy to just, of course, lump the filter into one filter. But you may not be aware of it. It may come, something may come out of one algorithm, and it gets plugged into another algorithm, and before you know it, you have stacked three filters. Shouldn't be a problem, right? Well, good. Hmm. That's the iterator of that stack of filters. Well, the problem is every iterator stores a functor. And, uh, and an iterator and another iterator. Hmm. And these two iterators, they are again storing two iterators and so on. So you get a nice explosion of your size of iterators. And boost range does that. If you just use Bay boost range, they pointed out in a news in a news group, and they were a little bit surprised. I was like, "Oh my God, didn't know that." Um, well, apparently, never anyone never measured. Um, so, so what do we do? We have to improve it. Um, we have to keep the iterator small, otherwise we can't iterate efficiently. So, let's have the idea that the adapter object. We introduce an adapter object. The adapter object will carry around the functor and the end iterator, because these two are common for all the iterators that are coming out of that range. So we store them in the range themselves. And then in the iterator, we just store a pointer to that, to that object and, we, and the actual base iterator. Now, better, it has as a consequence that iterators can't outlive their ranges. And thank God, the standard committee actually, I pointed this out, and they actually said, OK, yes, we do see this as a problem. Uh, we will require that an iterator only is, it lives as long as the range. You have to keep your range alive. You have to keep this object alive if you want to work with, with iterators. So they, they, have that, they, they saw that problem. Um, OK, now how does it look like? With um, when we apply that optimization, now well, we get this: the iterator has its range. Well, again, and 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 the base range, and the base range again points to its range, and it has a base range, and it again points to its range. We still get linear growth in the size of the iterators. So, this is state of the art of range v3. This is what's going to get standardized. There's nothing in the standard with that, that they, they're not receptive for, for indices, uh, for, for anything else but this. Um, so let's go beyond that. Let's try to fix it. Let's try to make ranges efficient. If we want to use them everywhere, they must be as efficient as we can possibly make them. 
so that no one thinks twice about stacking ranges endlessly. How do we do that? Let's introduce a new concept. Uh, we go from iterators to what we call index. An index is just like an iterator, except that if you want to do an operation on an index, you always have to supply the underlying, the, the, the range that the index belongs to. So the iterator itself, the index itself, can't do anything. The iterator can. You can say iterator plus plus. But with the index, you can't. You have to basically say, okay, range increment this index. You always have to supply the range. Let's see if this helps. Okay. Now, first of all, you may think, well, if this guy is now introducing indices, this is, this is incompatible with anything we've done so far in, in, in the past, and this is never going to fly. Well, luckily, any index you can trivially turn into an iterator by just packaging the iterator into the iterator. You just package the index plus a pointer to the underlying range. So compatibility is fine. That's not a problem. Let's see how the filter looks like when we do it with an index. So you have a filter, then you have an increment index, and here's the index. So you basically ask your base range in this case, you have a filter range, and in that filter range you store your base range. And then you ask your base range to increment your index. Please increment your index. And this index is actually the same type as the index for the base range. So the filter range's index is the base range's index. It's not the case for iterators, obviously, but for indices it's actually the case. And so you can just pass on the index to the increment index function of the base until you reached the end or until you again ask the base to dereference until you pass your filter function. And as you can see, your iterator is now just your index plus a pointer to the underlying range. And also all the iterators that we can build, no matter how deeply we stack this thing, are always just two words. We always have just a pointer to the range and a pointer to the index uh, and the actual index. And the, the index type is largely unchanging. When you are, when you are building big, big stacks, then, then you, and you, and you started off somewhere with a vector, you basically, for compatibility reasons, say, okay, the index of my vector is the it vector's iterator, that's just a pointer, and then you stack all these, these transforms and, and filters and everything on top, and nothing bad happens because the index basically stays the same. So at the end, you're still storing a, a, the index plus a pointer to the underlying, to, to, the, to the range, and the difference really comes from, well, which, which range am I pointing to? If I'm pointing to a filter range, then it's, the filter range is actually going to do the filtering. Okay, um, here's another thing that we do differently than from uh, range v3. Um, now, view filter creates a view. It creates a reference-like object. It does not create container. You, and it's clear because you want to do the filtering lazily. The view filter does lazy filter, does, does the filtering while you're actually iterating mm -hmm. over your filter. Um, now, here's a problem. Say you're creating a vector and you're pr putting that vector into view filter together with your predicate that you want to filter on. This shouldn't come, or in, in range v3, this does not compile. Because the create vector would have a dangling reference. As soon as you are leaving that statement, your filter that is storing a reference to your, to your container, well, the container just went out of scope. You have a dangling reference. Hmm. So then, and they decided, okay, that's, that's enough reason, because we want the view to really be a view rather than a container. We, uh, we just let this thing not compile. Now, this compiles. They have something called actions. They are creating containers, so they are actually storing values, but they do everything immediately. It's not lazy anymore. So you can easily imagine that there's a programmer that tries to use view filter 
and it doesn't compile, it's like, oh, this shitty box doesn't do what I want. So I'm going to try around a little bit. It's like, oh, yeah, great. I found action, comp uh, action filter. And that compiles. That does what I want. So I'm just going to use action filter. Well, the bad thing is that now they actually do everything, all the work up front. If they only need the first element, that's the whole point of ranges. If they only need the first element, they still filter the whole range first. And that, that's really a shame. So I think these things should be, should be orthogonal um, in, in, the, in the Think Cell library. And that's something that worked very well for us. Um, whenever you are passing an L value reference to a a, a, an adapter, it will actually just reference that, that underlying range. It will be a reference. But if it's an R value, if it's, if it's something that will go out of scope, we actually aggregate that container into the object. And the object will then actually become a container. It will no longer be a reference. And it's, it's not as theoretically pure as to say, okay, views are always references. This, the, the think cell filter sometimes can be a reference and sometimes a container. But in practice, it, makes, it makes, creates no problems. It's fine. We've used it for a long, long time. And it saves you from worrying about constantly having dangling references because you're building these, these, these big stacks of, of, of uh, adapters. And some of them are, are just R values. And, and you, don't want to take, you don't want to hold these R values somewhere. You don't want to have them in a separate variable because if you, if you have them in a separate variable, suddenly a function that's returning that stuff has to return two things. One is the, 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 the range and, and, and also you need to somehow return the, the underlying container. Um, it it's makes for clumsy programming. So we, we did this differently. Huh, this is something I added. Um, I want to show you how evil C++ is. And it has to do with these R values. Because they, they actually rear their ugly head in, in other circumstances um, as well. First of all, who thinks that this is OK C++? Autoconstruct T and makefoo. Makefoo is returning. I'm, I'm not writing right. This is makefoo, and this should be a foo and not a bar. So this is a foo. So make foo creates a foo, and I'm assigning it to an auto, t con, uh, auto construct. Is that OK? Yes. OK. Keyword here is temporary lifetime extension. So the, the lifetime of your, of your temporary gets extended until basically until this, the, the, the variable goes out of scope. How about this? It's bad. So as soon as you take that R value and pass it through something, it's broken. It doesn't create the temporary lifetime extension anymore. And this is terrible, because it really makes the language inconsistent. This temporary lifetime extension is this thing that they invented to, to taper over a problem um, that they didn't have the right tools for. Um, there are other things in the, in the, in the uh, standard that, that go in, in, the same, in the same direction. std min and std max, they are both broken. Why are they broken? Because they take things by constref and pass it out by constref. They take a t constref, t constref, and return a t constref. Now, if you pass in an r value, you suddenly turned an r value into an l value reference. You lost the information. In your, in your type system, that this is an ephemeral value, that this will go out of scope. That, that's, that's evil. Um, so here we have a dangling reference. And I would say, let's deprecate these temporary lifetime extensions. They are, they are an ugly duckling in the, in the type system. Um, with auto, you can do something much, much better. Why not give this thing the right type? Um, Let's call it auto CREF. I don't really care much about how it's being called. But when you assign an L value reference to it, it should produce an L value reference. If you assign an R value reference to it, it should turn that R value reference into a value. It should basically take care of, of holding on to ephemeral values that will go out of scope pretty soon. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that in the language, but 
we have it in a macro in our library, so you can download it and uh, you can use it. It's also very easy to implement yourself if you want, um, but we use it a lot. <clears throat> and yeah, the auto construct is really ugly. Okay, um, what we also have uh, that something that goes beyond the range v3, and we kind of stole it from uh, from boost range, is um, that you can specify what kind of return you would like to have from algorithms. So um, usually when you do a find, like here, you just get an iterator back. But maybe that's not what you want. Maybe you want the the the, um, the 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 range that comes after the 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 element that you found. Maybe you want the range that comes before. Um, maybe you want to say, um, I I don't expect an end, because I mean, what what's an end? It's like nothing. Um, so here it is. So return iterator. Here you can say, okay, return iterator or end, and you write find return iterator or end. But if you fi write find return iterator. There is basically a, there, there is an assertion here that says, oh, if my find didn't find anything, then I'll, it'll call pack singleton. It'll say, okay, I do whatever you would do if I don't find anything. And it would assert because you don't expect that to happen. Um, here's the case where return head, you take everything that's before the, the thing that you, that you are looking for. Um, so there are now, I don't know, some, some 23 different policies, which are all kinds of combinations. So it's only 23, they're not going to be any more, um, all in the library, where you can actually specify what, you, what you're expecting as a, or what you want from your algorithm return. Again, you don't want to repeat your, your, your begin and end. So once you have a range, you, otherwise you'd be forced again, if you want to create a range, to again mention begin and end because you want to have the head or the tail. Um, but this way, you don't have to. Here's an uh, important addition um, going further and further away from, from the standard. Um, I think this is, this is a very important addition to, let me, um, to, the, to the world of ranges. So far, we, have, we talked about ranges as having iterators. Which is, maybe you think, yeah, that's kind of a natural thing to do. Um, but there are many things that you iterate over which don't have iterators. Here I have as a toy example, for example, if you want to have the, the widgets in the, in the window. So you have sub-windows and these have widgets and you have this recursive structure that you want to iterate over. And you'd like to treat that as a range. It's kind of like a range, right? It's a, it's a sequence of elements. But to write an iterator to do this is pretty ugly. You, you rather write something where you, you, and that's, that's the typical visitor pattern, where you stick things into functions. And, and right now in C++, we have two separate worlds. We have ranges, which work with iterators, and we have visitor patterns, where you plug in some callback, and you call it the callback gets called. And, but these two things are really related. They are, they are they're similar. And, and you want to use a similar syntax with both. Um, so here's how it would look like if you do that. So you have, say, an any of, which is a regular range algorithm, and you're plugging in your traverse widgets, which right now you, you, you turn the traverse widgets takes a functor. So the, the thing that we actually decided is anything that actually takes a functor, any, any visitor functor, so a functor that takes a functor that is called with the elements, we will allow as a range. This would, can be treated as a range. Um, so this is the range in this case, and this is what we are the, the, the predicate of the any of. So it gets widgets and it returns whether the mouse hit the widget. Now it, it's pretty easy to imagine how this is implemented, right? Uh, maybe I have it. You don't, I don't have it yet. Um, so you you just basically when, whenever this this functor here um, has to be this thing. Now. Here are the two, the, 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 the theoretical underpinning of, of the difference between iterators and, and visitors. In an iterator, you have the consumer at the bottom of the stack. So you have your program flows along, and whenever it wants a value, it says star it, and then it says plus plus it, and then it says star it. And so it, the, the bottom of the stack is flowing along, and, and, and the producer is at the top of the stack, and you always reach up into the producer and say, hey, give me a value. Okay, and that's what iterators are doing. Now, that's nice for the consumer, 
Because the consumer at the bottom of the stack has a single contiguous code path. You can write a single program with the, the way you're used to writing programs and, um, and, and you, you can store arbitrary amounts on the stack, the stack stays around, everything is fine. For the iterator, and we, we saw already writing iterators it would be difficult sometimes, for the iterator it's, it's, the life is harder because every time you are going and calling star it, it basically has to recover its state. It has to know, okay, I have my, my contiguous code path, it, it's just not there. It's, it's, I, I'm, I'm at the beginning of star it, I have to find out where were I in my tree. I have to look up, up, I have to store it somewhere. And, and then I have to produce another element, and when I return, all my stack is gone. I can't store anything except for the things which I actually stored inside my iterator. So, so I have to decide, I have to have a finite amount of memory in the iterator that I store from one call of star it to another call of star it, or I have to do a heap allocation, which I probably don't want to do for performance reasons. Um, so here, the consumer has a good life, it's at the bottom of the stack, the producer has a much harder, uh, harder life and, and also has worse performance because it has to restore the, the, uh, the state every time. Now we can turn this around. We can say, okay, the producer is at the bottom of the stack and the consumer at the top of the stack. And that's exactly the, the, the it's called internal iteration or the visitor pattern. That's probably <clears throat> how many people know it. And this time the producer is, has the privilege of being at the bottom of the stack and it's, it has all the advantages and the consumer is at the top of the stack. Um, and really it's, it's, it's kind of, you don't really know in advance how you want to, how you want to, to, to have it. Whether you want to give the consumer the advantage or the producer the advantage. Depends on your problem. But unfortunately with C++ iterators, you're kind of forced to do it one way. And you shouldn't be. Um, of course it would be nicest if the consumer and the producer would both be at the bottom of the stack. That'd be beautiful. This is what coroutines do. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, so this is kind of conceptual, right? This is how it looked like. Um, now, the coroutines come in two flavors. One is really slow, which is the, the stackful coroutines. Um, they basically are operating system fibers. You're building essentially two threads without the scheduling. And then you're running these two threads and you just pass execution from one to the other whenever you're yielding a value or you, need, or you return a value or you need another value. So you just pass execution between the two threads. You pay ping pong with your, with your execution. And, um, but if you implement these as operating system fibers, they all get one megabyte of virtual memory as, as a minimum stack. Um, so, and and uh, you're very soon you're gonna, gonna have scalability problems, you can't do this. Uh, and, and also, I mean, you, it's, it's only, there's no optimization from switching, switching operating system fibers. So for practical purposes, you can't use it. Um, there are these stackless coroutines, which are now coming in, in C++, um, well, actually, I'm, I'm not sure whether they're coming, but there is a, rain, there's a coroutine TS out there, um, uh, Goa from Microsoft um, is, is doing it. It's still a bit expensive. Um, because essentially in the, in, the, in the general case, you still have a dynamic jumping point. Whenever you jump from, from the place where you, you, you have two executions, flows of, flows of execution, and the, the compiler cannot necessarily predict when you go and get the next value where you are going to exactly continue execution. You have to essentially what amounts to a virtual function call. You, you have to make a dynamic dis determination where you are going to continue your control flow. That also means that you may not be necessarily be able to inline everything aggressively. It's not going to be become one program. It's going to be two programs with that, that interrupt at the time when you do your virtual call. It's kind of like a virtual function. You cannot optimize across these, ba uh, these barriers very well. Um, there, are, there are a few... I, I don't have a slide for that, but the, 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 the core of coroutine art, and, and people try to solve it in different ways, the, the core problem of coroutines is you have an execution flow and your stack is, is growing up and down while you are going through your program, while you're calling subroutines. And at some point, you're going to switch to another coroutine. And that's if you, if you take all these places where you switch to another coroutine 
that gives you the minimum amount of stack you need to keep for that coroutine. And this is different for every coroutine. So you would have to analyze the coroutine to essentially know how much stack you have. And these things, they both pessimize in, or they, they pessimize in different ways. You could, one, one says, the stack for coroutine says, I'm not going to analyze the stack at all. I'm just going to use a regular stack with all the virtual memory, and I'm, I'm just spending all my, my memory on that. It's fine. I'm not going to take care of anything. The stackless coroutine goes the, the other way. It goes into the other extreme. It essentially says, I'm going to do stack switching only on the bottom coroutine, only on the, on the, only on the bottom function. So whenever I'm, I'm running a coroutine, I mark it up as coroutine. This function is a coroutine. That means that any stack that is taken up by that function is part of the coroutine state, but only of that one function. And when you call another function out of that function, this function cannot, cannot yield. It cannot jump to another coroutine because you didn't take care of the, that, that, you, that you, the compiler didn't know that it has to keep that stack around. So in an ideal world, what we would like to have, and, and, and well, Gore, I, I talked to him about it, the, the guy who did the uh, N4402 uh, at CPPCon, and he, uh, he was receptive, but I think it is just a, a difficult problem. It requires a lot of rework of, of existing infrastructure. Uh, it would involve the linker and, and, and other things. So it, in an ideal world, you would like to have that, that stack trace, where you say, okay, here I, I, my compiler knows here I want to switch, and underneath I have these four functions, and that's why my stack state has to be that large. And when I go beyond that, I can switch to a general stack. I switch stack to something more general, where I have any amount of memory, but I know I won't switch to another coroutine there. And that then would make coroutines truly general and, and, and truly, truly performant, as performant as they can be, because they don't waste memory anymore and still flexible so you can call functions inside coroutines. And right now you can't have it both ways. You can either have stackful coroutines, there's a boost implementation I think, that's, that's, that doesn't have a very good performance, um, and, and in particular it wastes a lot of memory, and the other one is the stackless coroutine, and that may make it into the standard. So we'll see where this goes, but at this point uh, this is not going to solve our range problem. So, but maybe we don't have to solve it. It turns out many of the algorithms that we are using, for them actually internal iteration is good enough. Now for find it's not because it returns an iterator. Actually it's fine if you make it return a value, then it's okay. So we actually have a variation of on, on, on find that returns you a value and that you can use with, with internal iteration. Uh, binary search, well that, that's really iterator land. But many other ones are okay with internal iteration. For each is fine. For each is probably the most frequently called thing that, that you're doing with iterators. And, and actually it is fine with internal iteration. It's, it's actually turning kind of external iteration into inter internal iteration. Accumulate is fine. All of any of none of is fine. Many of the adapters are fine. So you can run a filter or a transform on internal iteration on a visitor pattern and it'll, it'll just be very natural. Um, so we decided we want to allow ranges that, that only support internal iteration. Um, so here is the, the any of implementation, right? You're essentially putting into some enumerate or for each function um, that, that, is, that is just wrapping. It's, it's essentially compatibility sugar. It's a compatibility layer that for iterators is doing a for each. And for the new ones, that the new visitor pattern, it just invokes the visitor. So there's a compatibility layer. And in that one, you just plug in a, 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 a functor that, that accumulates up your, your, um, your, your booleans. And this is actually the any of without a predicate. You have an any of without a predicate. Um, otherwise, you would have to invoke the predicate here. Now, is that good? Is that, is that good enough? Is that, does, that, does that perform like any of? Well, it doesn't. Um, because any of stops when it encounters a true, right? We don't do that yet. Hmm. So something is missing in our internal iteration world. We need to be able to stop. Ha! We use an exception. That's great. When we actually, when we, when we, when we want to stop, we just uh, abort the visitor with an exception. And then the visitor, the exception comes out of the visitor and, and the visitor is interrupted. 
mm, doesn't work, it's too slow. Um, exceptions are just slow when they're thrown. Now, the second idea is quite simple. We use an enum, break or continue. Um, and, and when we, we pick basically one particular type, and when it's returning break, when, when, the, when, the, um, when, the, when the, the visitor here is returning that type, then we know we interpret this as stopping or continuing. If it returns anything else, we always continue. So it has to, it has to really make an active decision, I want to break, and then please use that type and actively break. Um, the, uh, the generator range can actually elide that break check. So only if the break or continue actually returns, well, only when the functor returns break or continue, we have to check, but then we can do it compile time. We can decide, are you going to ever break? And if he returns void, we know, no, it's not, never going to break. So that's fine, we don't have to check. Um, let's see, um, what does that give us, this internal iteration? Um, let's look at concatenation. So you have heterogeneous lists, you have a list uh, of, of something, and you have a vector of something, and you want to iterate over them together, so you write that concat. Hmm. Well, with indices, it's kind of complicated, because the index of a concat can either be an index of the first range, or it can be an index in the second range. And we have to kind of accommodate both. We have to say, okay, you know, either you are, you are still in your first argument's land, or you already iterated past that, and now you are in the second argument's land. And worse, whenever you're doing an increment, you actually have to, and this is, this is where you, the bytes you being on top of the stack. This is exactly where you have to restore your state. Um, you have to switch on the type of index you have. If you are still living in the first range land, then you have to do the first range thing. You have to increment it in the, in the context of the first range. And if you reach the end of the first range, you switch over to the second range. But if you are already in the second range, you simply increment the second, with the second range. But that switch here, you have to do every time. You have to always, it's always a big surprise. You always get a new index, and it's like, oh, okay, I now got one of the second range. Um, and that surprise really shouldn't be. You don't need this to do this every time um, when you increment. Now, the same holds true for the dereferencing. You, know, you also have to, to switch on, on the type of index you have. Now, you can avoid this with generators. If you, turn this with, if you write this with internal iteration, it becomes simply this. So the concrete range keeps all the stuff that we had. It keeps its iterators and everything. I mean, in case someone needs iterators, we, we, we keep it around. It's, it's a good implementation to have. But in addition, we offer an interface that, is, that, is, that, is, uh, that has internal iteration. So you essentially have a, you, you just pass in the functor and you first enumerate over the first range and then you enumerate over the second range. What could be easier? This is a performance that is absolutely on par with, with handwritten code, right? Because you do nothing else what you wouldn't have done naturally. You just iterate over first the first range and then the second range. All right. Now, I'm getting to the end. Um, we have, now we have all this range stuff. And I really want to say, I hate the range-based for loop. It should have never been added to the C++ standard. Because everyone is writing this. They are writing plain old for loop. It's just a for loop by another name. They could have written this. Thank you very much. And questions, I think. Um, I think we have a microphone. Here. Okay, let me ask a question. Why do you think is the standard committee or Eric Nipple himself not susceptible to? Changes or suggestions for changes. You said your solution is better. What do you think? It, 
I think it's. A, I think I wouldn't. Uh, I, I don't want to say anything bad about Eric. I think there is a. I, I think it is a part of how the standard committee works. Um, when you when you are trying to submit something to this to the standard committee, um, you basically have to stand up to the scrutiny of the standard committee for a long, long time. It is a very long process, and. Someone just jumping in and say, hey, I got this great idea um, that is potentially disrupting what people agreed on already for the past two years. And it has been f done going through that committee um, for a while. And they, they kind of say, OK, but, but now we are, almost have, we are almost in agreement. And, and I think we can standardize this. And, and now we want to go back and, and start all over again. It, it's it's very very rare that 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 this would actually happen, and so I had a similar. I was actually at the standard committee a few times, and um, and a similar thing happened with with std any and and std variant, because arguably std variant is the safer and 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 the kind of the solution of choice. You should give people a chance to take a look whether they can use std variant because std variant is much more restrictive than the open-ended std any. But at that time, um, std any had found its way to the standard committee already. They already had kind of agreement and, and I, I stood up and said, hey, we don't have std variant, but we have std any. Well, how can this be? How can we give people so much rope to hang themselves uh, if, if we don't give them a good alternative? And, and the answer was, well, no one proposed std variant. No one actually made the effort. And maybe if we had made the effort to go through the standard committee, maybe we would have done it. Uh, maybe we could have influenced it more than we did. Um, but it's, it's tedious. And you need someone who is, who, is, who is technically very good and who can answer all the questions. And they basically have to spend their whole working time um, on, on pushing this thing through the standard committee. And that, that's number one. And number two is our library is lives from uh, constant changes. So th this is why I think the library is good, because we can change it all the time. And, and if you, it, is, it would be very difficult for me to say, OK, this is the state that I want to now put in this, into the standard, and that I have to defend, although I may know that, I, that things can be better. Where, I, like, by the time it's two years on, we already have something better. And, and now I have to still push this through the standard committee because that's what the papers say and this, this is what we, what we defended. And, and now we, we're going to standardize that. And so it's, I don't know, I don't have any ideal solution for these problems. Um, I just know for in our little world and our little ThinkSell world, we have that luxury of changing both at the same time. And, and we, we take that luxury and, 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 and live well with it. So. Make some good arguments for your library compared to V3. And clearly, it's open source. You also make the argument that you change it all the time. Do you know if any other company uses your library and you recommend using your library? Uh, <laughs> I think. I mean, the, the worst can happen uh, is that you take the library and, and fork it and, and live with it. Um, I mean, and, and that's not so bad. So even if you hate the constant change, you can still lock it in and say, well, I'm going to take what I have, and, and, and that, that, that's OK. Um, would I recommend using it? Yes, I, I would heart, wholeheartedly recommend. I mean, otherwise, we wouldn't use it. Um, it's it's, it's going to be. It's, it's not well documented, and, and you, have to, you have to read through it, but the, the assumption is, or the, 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 uh, the, the, our, our goal is, and I think we are pretty close to that, um, is that you, it's, it's very intuitive. If you write a filter, I mean, what, what is a filter going to take? And it takes a range and a predicate, and it gives you back a range. And, and if you, you, you can't mess up very badly, because if you put in an R value, then you still get an R value back. So, so the, idea, um, the, the way we design the library is, is not so much from theoretical, and maybe that's a difference also to, to range v3, is not so much from, theoretical, from a theoretical basis, but from a basis of, I'm writing this expression into my code. What do I expect to happen? And, and the, there, essentially, this, 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 this R value problem, for example, doesn't pass the test of being intuitive, natural. It, it, you, you want something that's, that's, that, that works 
in all t at all times. And I, I think our library does it more than, than others maybe. And I, I think it's, it's, we try to make it canonical. We try to make it, it's like, okay, how else could it be? It's just write what you think and then it should work. And we even, that's how the library grows. I mean, people come to me and say, hey Arnold, I, I wrote this. Why doesn't it work? And if there isn't a good reason why it shouldn't work, then we should make it work. And yeah, I would recommend using it, sure. All right. Okay, other questions? Oh. Um, for the library, do you also plan to, do you have any plans to explore the tooling which could aid uh, the refactoring changes that are introduced in the library? No. Um, no, the reason being um, that for us, of course, all this tooling stuff is a one-off. We have a change, then we go through the, our code and change our... I mean, that's a very egoistic perspective, uh, I, I'm fully aware. Um, but we, Han is, is developing the little tools, he's using whatever he, he, he finds useful, uh, whether it's Clang Refactor or whether it's, 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 uh, it's uh, RegAxis or whatever, whatever helps him. But once it's done, it's done. Our code base has been ported. So we don't have a good like a modernize. We, we won't implement a big modernize because um, um, Clang refactor and modernize or whatever because it, the, the, once the code base is, 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 is modernized, it's, it's, it's finished. The work's finished for us. So there we are egoistic and, and we don't. I think you mentioned in the beginning that uh, your library evolved from Boost or Boost range in particular. So, uh, do you um, return the, the favor, so to say? Do you pu up push to upstream or? We um, well, I mean, unfortunately, we, we do submit to to Boost to to Boost in general. So um, things which are where we actually do contributions, like Boost Spirit, for example, we haven't customized Boost Spirit to, to anywhere near the extent that we, that we did to the ranges. Um, so we are still quite close to the actual code uh, in Boost. And there we do many fixes to the, uh, to the, um, to the source code. Um, the Boost range is pretty much dead. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it has been superseded by, by range v3. So, um, and, and we kind of, I think we are also losing the last parts of, of, of Boost range pretty quickly. Uh, I think we removed like boost range reference or something was one of the last remnants with, that we actually used, but that has been superseded now as well. So it, 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 it's just going out. And so there's not a really a natural code pace where to, where to put, add, add these things to. Uh, we would have to really come up with our own boost library, which we haven't, which we haven't done and for kind of similar reasons that we didn't do a, a, a standard library submission. Last chance. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Arnold. Thank you. Thank you.